Um, so the next group that'll be presenting here is going to be talking about disinformation, um, which is a, obviously a very hot topic right now. And um, it's going to be Chloe Morgan, Corinne Zilnicki, and Diane Rosenfeld. Um, so they will be talking to you about their paper, which was presented at the International Public Relations Research Conference in Orlando. So um, I will stop my share and let the ladies begin. So two thirds of Americans find disinformation to be an epidemic problem and that number is only growing. Good afternoon, I'm Chloe Morgan and uh, with me I have Corinne Zilnicki and Diane Rosenfeld, and together we decided to study disinformation response strategies. Now, disinformation is a specific subset of misinformation. It is a blatant act of deceit where an actor puts out falsehood to try to manipulate public opinion. And today we see evidence of more than 70 countries weaponizing disinformation via social media to fuel international propaganda machines. Now, this isn't something that just affects us as the military or as the government. This can affect organizations and brands, and it's important for all PR practitioners to study this subject. So to study the effective correction of disinformation, our research built on Coombs' 2007 situational crisis communication theory. Now, this theory tells us that rumors, which are also a subset of misinformation, fall into the victim crisis type, and it recommends using deny response strategies to help rebuild an organization's reputation following a misinformation crisis. But our research didn't stop with SCCT. We looked at other mass communication as well as psychology scholarship to see if we could identify another response strategy to pair with our SCCT deny response strategies. And we found one, reputation. So the more we looked at SCCT, the more we began to wonder, should we actually be handling disinformation as a crisis? That is, does disinformation actually fit into this response framework? Now, existing PR research focuses mainly on misinformation, such as rumors, instead of specifically looking at disinformation, which led us to ask, well, what are the appropriate strategies for handling this specific issue? And then we thought about the fallout. So what could possibly happen to an organization's believability, credibility, or even reputation following a disinformation attack? So how do we go about answering these questions? Well, we designed an online experiment with 249 students, and we employed a three by two factorial design. What does that mean? Well, we're looking at two independent variables. The first independent variable was response strategies. So very similar to what Diane was talking about before. This is what all of us as PR practitioners would use and maybe what we would put out in our statements. So the first one, denial, just a straight out denial of what the aggressor is saying about you. The second response strategy is reputation. So that's denying, but also building upon it, saying exactly why it's wrong, giving amplifying information so people can come to their own conclusion. And the last category is attack the attacker. That's exactly what it sounds like. You're trying to besmirch your aggressor's uh, reputation and to try to make yourself come ahead. Now, the second variable we're also all familiar with is imagery, and that is the presence or absence of. A lot of times when we're doing our press releases, we accompany them with an image, a video, an infographic. And in this case, we use an annotated map. Now, the military is rife with examples of disinformation. I'm sure many of you on this call have dealt with it yourself. Um, so what we looked to for an example was in June 2019, uh, Iran shot down a US drone that was operating in international airspace. Iran decided to go to the international media and tell them that actually the drone was wrongly, uh, they asserted that the drone was operating in territorial airspace, saying that they had every right to shoot it down. It took the US government a bit of time to respond and there were mixed results. So by using this, we really wanna show, um, you know, sometimes there's a ton of conspiracy theories about your organization. This is one of those where the juice is worth the squeeze. If the international media is believing this false account, you as PR practitioners, we, we need to respond. Um, so this is why it was the perfect example. So in this experiment, everybody saw the priming article. That's Iran uh, saying they're just truthful accounts of events. Then six out of our seven cells saw some manipulation, some uh, combination of response strategy and imagery. 
and there is both pre and post tests. And what we were really looking at is first off public perceptions of truth. And we measured this twofold. We measured it by organizational believability. So how much people believed Iran versus the US military. And we looked at it as statement credibility, which statement did, did participants view as more uh, credible. Uh, the other thing that we looked at is reputation. That's pretty common in situational crisis communication theory, but we measured it before and afterwards to see really how the changes uh, occurred based on our responses. So this experiment yielded five key takeaways for us. And just as a disclaimer, every result that we discuss here on out is statistically significant. So the first big takeaway, any response lowered Iran's believability and credibility. We found this out by doing independent samples t-test um, and it would make you believe that any response strategy is better than no response strategy. However, we can't just try to focus on lowering an aggressor's believability and credibility. We need to look to boost our own, which led us to our next finding. So our second key takeaway is that reputation is the most effective response strategy. One way ANOVA showed us that the use of reputation had a positive effect on US believability and credibility, as well as a negative effect on Iran's believability and reputation. Um, and since the three of us are practitioners, this was frankly a relief to find that uh, one of the response strategies was so effective and so powerful at cutting through that disinformation. So we were excited about this one. Um, and remember that when you refute something, you're not only saying that's false, that's wrong, um, you're adding more, you're adding amplifying information to explain or prove why something is false. So in our study, we used reputation to paint a more detailed picture of what happened and also add background information about the US Navy's activities in the area. And speaking of painting a picture, uh, we found another tool useful in the fight against disinformation, which leads me to key takeaway number three. And that is that responses using imagery affect believability and credibility. So independent samples t-test showed that the use of imagery had a positive effect on US believability, as well as a negative effect on Iran's believability, credibility, and reputation. So subjects in our study who saw the map showing the actual path of the US drone were more likely to believe the US and doubt Iran. And the lesson here is pretty straightforward for us is that practitioners should uh, be using photos, videos, infographics, other visuals to capture people's attention, which as we all know can be difficult and fleeting. Um, and then once you have their attention to illustrate the truth. Our fourth key takeaway is that information favors the aggressor. Using a paired samples t-test, we saw that Iran's reputation increased slightly following the disinformation event. Now, this is a troubling finding, but it does align with other psychology research in the subject matter. So we know now as PR practitioners that the organization spreading disinformation about our organization is going to see a boost in their reputation. This brings me to our fifth and final key finding, which is an organization's reputation is extremely important. We did two linear regressions, one for the US as well as one for and we found that the most predictive variable in assessing an organization's post reputation was their reputation before the crisis. So there were other var predictive variables such as the organization's belief, message credibility, as well as response strategies that negative positively impacted the organization's reputation, far and away the most impactful was the organization's pre-crisis reputation. So as PR practitioners, we now have tools in our toolbox, such as response strategies and the use of imagery to help us weather a disinformation crisis, but we also know that building a strong reputation for our organization will help us even more once that disinformation crisis, crisis hits. So to wrap it all up, we can all think in our mind of examples of disinformation. 2016 presidential election. Even look at what's going on right now with the COVID-19 pandemic and the information coming out of Russia and China. Now those are some pretty big examples of country on country disinformation, but we can also focus in on there are smaller cases of it. For example, in 2015, Russia decided to target a small turkey farm in rural Pennsylvania. 
Uh, the Internet Research Agency decided to use troll accounts to uh, say that the turkeys were contaminated and poisoning people. And their purpose was to prepare for the 2016 election, to see if they could get the American people to believe what they were putting out there. So it's pretty crystal clear. All of us at some time are going to run into this. But with these tools that we provided today, hopefully your organization can boost its credibility and ultimately keep foreign disinformation from becoming domestic misinformation. Um, now, if you all look in your chat, we attached a PDF with the summary of our findings, but we're open to any questions. Thank you.